Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to our second day of workshop. We have four more pieces to go today. Uh, first piece, I like to start with into landscape. So may I ask for composer to say something about your piece? Yes, yes. hello everybody. everybody. Uh, good, morning. good morning. Thank, Thank you, you for this for amazing, amazing opportunity. opportunity. And, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm second, a year second year student from Rio Highway. Highway. And, and my piece is called Into, into a landscape. landscape. And basically, and basically explore the, the relationship, relationship between sound, sound uh, performers, performers uh, listeners, listeners, and, and the, instruments. the instruments. And it creates, and it creates kind, of kind of a door, a door into this landscape, 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 landscape where, where, in which you can, you can enter, enter and, and uh, leave, leave as you prefer. As you prefer. And, and the idea, the idea was, was kind of to make it rise and fall with the music. And yeah, I hope you enjoy. Yes, so we play too, your piece. Okay.
Uh, thank, you thank you very, very much. much. Um, that was really that was really, really nice. nice. Thank you, thank you to, to uh, all the all performers. performers. Um, yeah, I yeah, mean, I, I mean, have I a, a, maybe a little, little thoughts, thoughts that, that also, also can be can shared be with the committee. Well, well, first of all, I was maybe thinking that in bar 55, 55 and 56, and 56 where, where there is kind of the, the, uh, the crescendo, the piano, piano to triple forte. I understand that maybe the triple tremolo doesn't make it so effective. So I might, so I might uh, change, uh, change that, that to maybe, maybe a single, single tremolo or no tremolo, or tremolo because, because I want that fourth to fourth to fourth to be really forte, really forte and, the and the difference then with the, uh, the, uh, the PP. Um, I was thinking, thinking because I was thinking, thinking that, that as kind of, kind of the climax to the piece. The piece. And then, and then uh, maybe, uh, maybe I was thinking about unison between maybe the second violin and and, um, and yeah, and yeah maybe, maybe some, some unison, unison still, still in bar, bar 49, 49 the trail the for the cellos, cellos maybe, maybe to be more, more together, together or, or to start, to start to the trill not, not to kind of go the accelerando but, but to, to do a kind, kind of, of at the at same, same time all the time, time. but yeah but i would yeah, like to hear some some thoughts Can you, Can hear, you me? hear me? Are you getting, Are you getting feedback, feedback while I talk? talk? Um, I want to talk about dynamics for a little bit uh, because as I look uh, at this score, uh, I see some interesting things when it comes to dynamics. So like, for example, in page, I'm um, sorry, measure 36, uh, you've got in cellos one and two, you've got these uh, four down bows in a row that are marked mezzo piano over and over again uh, with each strike of the bow. And the thing is, is that once you set a dynamic, you don't need to alter that dynamic until it changes. So uh, just as a composer, I want you to know that you don't need to rearticulate uh, your dynamics um, until they change in some way. Um, and I see that kind of a lot. You know, I see it in measure uh, uh, 40. 40. Um, um, I, see I see it in, it measure, in measure 43, 40, 43 41, 41, 42, 42 throughout, throughout these, these whole pages. pages. There's, There's a lot, a lot of, of stuff, stuff like that. Like that. Um, um, and it's and kind it's of kind confusing. confusing. You know, you, you know, see you it see down in page, page 13, 13 in the cellos. In the cellos. You, have you have a piano. A piano on B1, then, then on B2, two. piano, piano marked, marked again, again crescendo, crescendo to forte, to forte. Back, back to piano, to piano. Then, then piano again, again on the downbeat. Down so, so it's a lot, it's a lot more, more than, than you, need. you need. You really you just really need just piano, piano, crescendo to forte, piano, crescendo to forte. Um, dynamics can be really tricky in that way. It's really something you should keep an eye on. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just trying to be over, to over clarify, but yeah, I understand that it's confusing and it's. I, oh, I totally, I totally, I totally get no, that. Uh, trying yeah. to be really clear and everything, but the thing is, is that what the players do is they they feel responsible for reading everything, yeah. um, and it's sort of like um, a lot for the eye and it can end up in the long run taking away from the ability to speak freely into the music to express yourself to feel the phrase or the gesture that that you're trying to uh, express um, perhaps in the interest of time we should talk more about musical issues and anything that you'd like to hear um, again or anything that you'd like to try in a in a different way um, yeah maybe I will try that uh, that passage that I was describing uh, starting from bar uh, 56 and maybe trying to do it without the tremolos and accentuating more 
this relationship with piano to triple forte. And, and I'll just say, I mean, I, congratulations. I think it's a beautiful work. I particularly found the ending really striking. Um, so thank you. Good work. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly some things that are perhaps over notated or redundant, but, um, yeah, it happens. <laughs> In that particular passage, um, I was wondering if maybe we could arrive at the triple forte at on beat four. So you just have some more time to be in that special dynamic before you're going back down. And also, I wonder if the sopant could be um, across the whole two bars between 56 and 57. So basically you go from ordinary at the start of 56 and then 57 would be completely so pont, just so we can hear um, that change. Because um, again, I think I mentioned this yesterday, but um, I think there are some indications that don't really allow time um, for us to perceive um, the timbral changes or the dynamic changes for that matter. Again, from um, maybe around bar number 46, or oh, no, we play again from 49, and then we play that middle section, that, that support cello section, okay? So we play, instead of we play ordinary in the beginning of the bar, and then we go to support the cello at the end of the bar. We do that like two bars. First bar, we play ordinary, and then we crescendo to two bars. And at the end, we, we, we kind of like go, do you still need the effect of ordinary playing that changed, slightly changed to support cello? Or we just need like, we just play support cello right away? No, maybe the change will be nice to go through yes and and you can change every two bar as yeah okay so but the dynamic we still play the same right we have yeah you know and then at the end of the mm -hmm. bar we go to three forte right yes and also um from a performer's perspective i feel that it's a little bit difficult when you mm -hmm. when you do a crescendo and also have a supponticello in the same time. Oh, okay. Because when, when okay. we play supponticello, that, yes. that's, that's like many levels of supponticello you can go. You can play like really on the bridge and it will not get any sound. It's just like a wolf tone or just the effect. But normally when we see a supponticello, we play not exactly on the bridge, but near to the bridge. Okay, so, so that's where we can do like a crescendo, but it's not gonna sound very loud like you play normally. So it's kind of a little bit um, difficult for us to play. Um, do you still need that tremolo or we change to 16 note? Or we, um, we can do the tremolo only in the fourth beat maybe. So start without the tremolo and then do the tremolo crescendo to the tremolo that was the idea maybe or we can try maybe we can try without uh for now and see how, how the sound goes yes. or, yeah um i will play from bar number 52 okay and now we do two bars from ordinary to supporticello and we do 16 note without tremolo also the dynamic is still the same okay
is a uh, 60 note that we play? Yeah, I think it sounds more clean and kind of gave the creepy sounds that I wanted to to achieve without overcomplicating uh, the score and the performance. So I think it, it, it kind of works. Thank you. Um, may I try something different? I like sure. to ask um, performers to play Suponticello right away at start, at the beginning of the bar number five, six. We play everything Suponticello. We exaggerate that dynamic, okay? And we play really on the bridge, not near the bridge. We, we, we try one time on the bridge. Same. Suponticello right away. We, we go to ordinary play at bar number six zero. Fifty-nine still the same. Okay? And we play tremolo. Okay, so so let let's hear that. Is it better? Uh, it is different. It's, it's interesting, actually. Uh, I, I quite like it, actually. Yeah, it makes it uh, even more creepy. And and um, yeah, no, it, it is a good thank you. It is uh, something to think about, definitely. I think it's a question of deciding um, how what parameters you're changing and also you know, if, if one thing stays the same, like the timbre in this case, we're able to perceive the dynamics more because the players are able to focus on it. So I think in a sense, um, it's a good lesson of just like picking your battles in terms of what you want um, to come out for the audience. Um, I think just physically the technique, um, sometimes it's hard to do all of it at the same time um, and also because if, if they're trying to do everything at the same time, some effects kind of cancel each other out. So you just have to make your decision. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I had a comment slash question about um, the start of the Vivace at measure 24 which is um, you notate this uh, 16th note figure as pianissimo and sultasto, but I think when they perform it, it comes across as a little bit, very, as, very, as rather intense, kind of molto perpetuo kind of music. I was wondering if you were happy with how it sounded or if you wanted to try something different, maybe more sultasto, maybe softer, but still keep the same tempo. Um, we can definitely try. I was, I was thinking, obviously, this part was... Um um yeah it had to be kind of uh, out of the eye and you had to hear but maybe yeah the actual uh sul tasto makes it too yeah too too loud we can try softer but then in that case i guess we have to make all of the uh kind of all of those 16 notes softer i think yeah i, I think this yeah. is the sultasto actually makes it softer so if you wanted to softer, try something we could okay. make it more oh, okay. soft, more tasto mm -hmm. No, I was just wondering, um, if it's just, again, I, I like the other example, it's a matter of deciding, yeah. you know, what kind of character yeah. you're looking for. Yeah, because uh, I was kind of going to Suponte and then going back to Sultasto and then going back to Suponte. So that was kind of the idea of, uh, mm -hmm. of crescendo, even in a way, but without dynamics. And um, so, yeah, but maybe we can try uh, uh, directly from Sulponte. If we have time, it would be interesting to hear. And maybe just very quiet and mysterious, just try yeah. a different character for those mm -hmm. 16th notes. Yes. We, we will play again from the Vivace bar number 24. And we do really super cello there when you have a 16th note. So just make 
like super contrast between um, Sutasto, right? Bar number 24. It's written Sutasto in my score. No? Oh, that, that was no, not written in the part. They don't have Sutasto. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Um, we try to exaggerate the difference between Sutasto and Supontisholo throughout the section. And uh, one of musicians have a um, question about bar number 36, about the collegno tratto that you write in bar 36. So can you clarify that how to play on first violin and second violin. Yeah, I wanted to create kind of a continuous uh, kind of, maybe you can do like a 16 note continues uh, on the on the bow, uh, on the legno. Well, like kind of rotating the, yeah, rotating the uh, so you want us to play long the whole bar, just one bow, or tremolo, or sixteen note? Um, maybe you can do. Um, maybe you can do one. Yeah, maybe you can do one um, big slur. Yes. Because when you, yeah, when we play that with mm -hmm. wood and hair in the same time, the sound is is quite soft. Mm. And, and and it's a little bit difficult to hear okay okay yeah and so do you suggest you maybe making it uh not like one but uh, like a tremolo yeah maybe we could do that as well yeah, it would yeah. Be great. we will try that thank bar you. as a tremolo yes thank you and now we play the middle section once again Yes, I think uh, I think I prefer it. I mean, it, it kind of changes a little bit the, the timbre, and, and it makes it uh, strong, and uh, and it kind of keeps the same uh, the same kind of ideology of this passage. So yeah, thank you. Any other comments before we move on to next piece? Okay, so. Next piece is Always Wandering by Yi Shi Zhong. So can I ask the composer to say something about the pieces? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Yi Shi and this is, uh, I'm a first year student in Mahiro. Um, this piece is mainly expressing a kind of chaotic feeling uh, from a working process, the kind of panic and struggling feeling with fitful wakefulness and a sense of incapability before uh, meeting the deadline. So as a 
it's a kind of common feeling as a composer or as a student specifically. Um, so I basically try on uh, using polytonality and the effect of different textures overlapping one another. Yeah. Thank you for the performance. I thank you for rehearsing my piece. And um, and uh, so first, I think uh, I made some mistakes on the dynamics, volume of uh, different parts. So the pizzicato parts, I uh, feel like it. Uh, it should be, uh, it should not be like sampler P, piano, uh, throughout keys, it uh, should be lo louder volume and this is the uh, first problem I think of and uh, um, and also the tempo of the of the entire piece and uh, I initially uh, wish it to be uh, faster like uh, it might change the whole feeling of the piece uh, and if is anyone uh, has any comment on this? Oh, uh, 
I really want to hear from the other mentor composers, but I, I will firstly just congratulate you. I think that you did an excellent job with this, with this work. There are so many great textures and elements and things that I really love about the piece. Um, Thank you. I, just maybe two things. I think that the ending section, um, basically from 41 onward, the double bass and cello is a little bit overbearing. And I think increasing the dynamic level of the pizzicati can maybe help with that, but also maybe just decreasing the cello and bass um, so that there's a little bit more space for the other elements. So I would say from 41 to the end, the lower strings can maybe be a little bit less. I don't know if you disagree with that, um, but I, I might try try it. And you could also try, you know, from this discussion about Soltasto and Ordinario and Sol Ponticello, maybe also making that um, Sol Ponticello so that it's a little bit more transparent. Uh, not transparent exactly, but without the same weight could help for to bring out some other things and you know have greater contrast between the lower string parts and the higher parts um and then the one other thing that i wanted to say was in the section with the quintuplets say 27 and also 38 because of the tempo i think there's not really time for the harmonics uh to speak in the parts that don't have the quintuplets Maybe we could try, I'm just curious, to try those sections at a slightly slower tempo. And for the people who have those artificial harmonics at the fourth, to really try and accentuate those, bring those out. And for the people who have the quintuplets and glissandi, to play maybe a little bit less, just to see. Hi, um, great piece, Ishii. I also had um, some questions about those quintuplet measures. So uh, bar 27 and 38. Um, for 27, I know they're sort of like repeated um, sections, um, but for 27, I was just wondering whether rubato is the best um, indication for this material. Um, and also you have a quite a big range for the rubato um, in terms of like how fast or slow. It's not really clear what, because rubato means like you take time. And because we're kind of boxed in by the quintuplet figures, it's not really music, let's say if it was um, a single line melody where, where you can be expressive and um, take give and take of time. Um, so maybe rubato is not the most appropriate indication. Um, it seems like music that should be quite rhythmic just because of all the details you've put in and it's very kind of beat to beat. Um, and that brings me to 38 because you've written uh, a writ over the three bars, but we don't know how much writ we should do. So I think even without indicating um, a target tempo, you can indicate if it's um, you know, a very uh, exaggerated writ where the quintuplets get very slow by the end, or if it's just something a bit subtle to before we arrive in the next bar. Um, so maybe, yeah, for 38, you know, do you want to decide now if it's just a subtle writ or something exaggerated? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I think it's a different, uh, sometimes we need to determine that uh, I, I I think just for the sake of experimentation and, could try and, te something. and testing, you could just try it and see. And if you dislike it, then you go back. So for the third, from the thirty eight, mm -hmm. yep. uh, 
Um, sorry if I misunderstand your suggestions like about the notation uh, for the 27, did you suggest that uh, to... I think um, it, it's not so much a, a notational question as it is, I think, just trying a slightly slower tempo and bringing out the harmonics if the ensemble can do that. And yes. then when you have the retard at 38, just make that molto and move to a slower tempo before the a tempo at 41. Okay. So we will play from bar 31, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, we play from beginning of agitato. And when we hit the bar, 27, we make it slower to those three bars, okay? Mm. And actually, we already made the pizzicato more strong than, than that meso piano in, in the rehearsal. Okay, so let's try that. work the way that you want? Yeah, I think maybe it should be slower. And, mm -hmm. and there's another thing I like to try. When uh, Dr. Tonia said about the ending section on bar 41, uh, I, th I think I think Ajahn Jay san say that. We kind of like bring out the melody from a first violin a little bit, so we um, reduce uh, double, blade, double bass and cello in bar 41. So we, we play less, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we can have, we can hear more melody on first violin. So. Um, and actually, I and also um, in bar 41, double bass have G, and you, can, you cannot play that double stop on, on double bass in bar 41 and 42. Okay. So we play only the lower note. Okay? Okay. Yes. So I will play from bar number 31 until the end. Okay, and in queen, yes, yes, in quintuplet section we made uh, retardando through that three bars, okay? And I, I try to make that faster, like you say, okay?
Yeah, I think that sounded much cleaner, and I like actually the tempo gives it more liveliness. Um, I just wanted to add something that maybe is not so much for revision, but just a comment that I really like the piece, and I what I like most about it is this, this subtle sense of humor that you have. It's not like haha funny, but it's um, very quirky in a very interesting way. You know, and I think that's something um, that you could consider playing around with more. Uh, for example, I think you play a lot with this block to different block and then blocks on top of different blocks, you know, which I think is a very Stravinsky-like approach, which is very interesting. But I'm wondering if you could play with sometimes um, trying to stretch the boxes a little bit or, you know, for example, play with expectation more. So, for example, if things are going... What happens if you add one... You know, just to keep with that same spirit of playfulness that you have, or sometimes uh, stretching phrases, you're playing with expectation. But I think it's just, yeah, just something that's very special about the piece and to consider, you know, playing with it more. I think for this miniature, it works great, um, but just for maybe for future pieces. Um, one thing maybe about register that I wanted to say is everything in this piece, with the exception of one measure, is everything is more or less lower to mid register. And I think that's partially why sometimes it's hard to differentiate the objects, you know. Uh, I don't know if, for example, in the measure 41 section that we were working where everything's on top of each other, if it could be interesting, um, again, not necessarily for this piece, but to have some of this pits music maybe much higher so you leave space for the melody to be in the middle or something like this, you know. Um, just consider that even even though you have these very special objects, you can still play around with them, transpose them, and um, just a comment for maybe future pieces. Thank you for suggesting. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything Igor said. Um, I think you know, go, coming back to this thing about the retard and the quintuplets, you know, I actually really. Now, comparing the two versions, I actually really liked the original tempo that the ensemble took. But I think that what was missing for me the first time around was the, um, the harmonics were missing a little bit. So maybe somewhere in between, you know, like not, not necessarily the tempo that they just took and not necessarily the original tempo, but somewhere in between without losing the intensity of the, of the quintuplets and glissandi, because I think that was de-emphasized in the most recent uh, run through. All right, so may I move on to next piece is Gossip by Stephen. <laughs> well, Stephen. Greetings all, yep. this is Stephen here. Um, thank you all for playing my piece, Gossip. And for this piece, this piece originally was composed when I was walking out of public. And there was during a time where Squid Game, Poppy Playtime, and Talent Politics are on very on fire. Lots of people are gossiping, talking about, a lot about that. So therefore, I decided, hey, I would like to write the music about those gossiping, making those conversation, conversations into uh, musical elements. And this piece was designed to be a fun piece. It's not particularly at my, the setting of my home country, but it's I want to make it a fun piece that on um, gossip in general, so the performers they can interpret from what they heard about the gossip nature and implement it into uh, into performing this piece. And yes, that's all I have to say. And please enjoy.
With many, many thanks. That was cool. <laughs> I really like how like the hey suddenly so surprising and it caught my attention because I kind of forget I it's kind of in the past. I can kind of forget this piece a little bit. I really like the interpretations from many of the performers. Mm, I don't think I have any much more much comments. I'll just probably say one thing. I'm not sure I could be mistaken. Maybe the violin one solo was about one bar ahead, or well, I'm not sure which way. I think that's all I hear. But everything else, I'm very, really grateful for all your performance. So I have a question, like what we did, is that every cue or every entrance, is that the way that you want? So you mean for the numbers in the box that I wrote, is that right? Yes, those are every cues actually mm. to help for all the performers to be together on time. That's initially the plan. Did I get it right? So, um, firstly, Stephen, congratulations. I think uh, it's a really fun piece. And I especially really liked the vocalizations and speaking and everything at the end. Um, you know, dealing with aleatory and these kinds of event boxes, something that I think about is ways in which I can um, ascribe variability within the events themselves. Um, and I think you've done a nice job of, you know, providing opportunities for them to play with those elements and to um, change the ordering of things. But what I would love to see is more variability internally in the way that like the different, different tempi are deployed or even transpositional levels or, you know, timbral considerations. And I think um, it's a little challenging in a workshop setting where you have such limited time to make those kinds of changes but it could be for the future interesting to experiment with 
different parameters that could be maybe loosened up a little bit to give them some space to, to play with those materials. And you wouldn't have to do it, you know, in every moment, but just selectively places where you feel like there could be um, like a broader acceptable range of interpretations. With many things, I'll take that into consideration. I have a similar comment to Jason's, um, which is that I, I felt like the piece worked super well texturally. You were able to control the activity um, in a really clear way. And um, I think it's actually more fun for us looking at the score at the beginning until the actual uh, vocalizations come in. But I think because you were so clear about um, the characters, it comes across to a listener as well. Um, but my major, um, I guess, um, comment about the piece is that it lacks a little bit um, change of harmony. So um, for example, I would have loved to have a big shift um, of harmony. That there was like one big moment where everyone comes in um, at bar 22. That might have been a moment to just change up the spacing or the kind of intervallic material. Um, and otherwise, I felt like the next major shift in harmony was when the vocalizations come in, in a way, because we sort of suddenly have this freedom. And so, um, I guess going back to what Jason says, I think within the boxes themselves, the gossiping boxes, um, that element of vo vocality is, isn't quite there. It's, it's very strict in terms of the notes and rhythms, but um, I mean, in the way we speak and in any language, really, there are kind of pitch ups and downs um, that I think could be better captured even at the very beginning. Yeah, I was actually going to say the same thing. A lot of the gossip boxes, they remind me of Missyan birds a little bit more than they remind me of speech, you know? I wonder if we just took some of the rhythmic notation away, if that could help. Yeah, because they're very precise. Um, I don't know if it's even worth trying the beginning, but uh, to have the violinists both not look at the rhythm, just look at the pitch. I totally like... agree with this idea. Initially, it was the first plan, but until it was like, was afraid if it's too free and the performer not sure what what I'm doing. But I think I would mm -hmm. I would like to try this idea also. Yeah, I mean, if, even if you just indicate some spacing, you know, like if the six thirty second notes don't have the stems, they'll be closer together, and the others will be a little further apart, and that'll give a sense of some indication of. Uh, but I think we should just, and it always also depends on the ensemble, you know, here everyone's obviously very good and game for experimenting and, you know, the vocal, the vocalizations are amazing, by the way. Um, so maybe it's worth trying, I don't know, we have time. Yeah, if, if we could take two minutes maybe to just try introducing some more internal rhythmic and maybe pitch level variability, like if they could if the musicians could freely kind of choose in some moments to transpose the pitch level of something up or down just slightly, could be interesting. Yeah. Also one note is that I think at measure eight, when it happened during the last run, um, the activity seemed to stop as soon as the cello solo comes in. I don't know if that was on purpose or I think we wanted the activity to keep going, right, Stephen? Yeah, actually, I want the activity to go on. And we measure eight, it shouldn't stop, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think I remember the ensemble dropping out a little bit and then the cello coming in, or just maybe it was just Zoom or something, I don't know. Um, mm, maybe it's Zoom, I would guess. Yeah. Anyway, I think we should maybe do it again until that moment or past that moment a little bit. Uh, depend on the, the ensemble. Maybe they can decide. I'm good with any, I'm good with anything.
we will play from um, queue number two at bar seven and make sure everything keep going, every activity keep going until Actually, everything is keep going until we hit bar number 22, right? Yes. So we can try that. And maybe we could just try to transpose some of the given pitches. Let's say in bar number 13, no, in bar number 14, when double bass come in with that low C, bar 14, um, we kind of like doing some harmonic shift. We change the pitches, maybe higher from what. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. and don't forget the rhythms as well. Yeah, some. We I, it, it, it could also be somewhat free, like not only in measure 14, but at the discretion of the performers, just choose selectively once in a while to, to change the pitch level. Mm. Okay. So we play from bar number eight, Q3. Especially from here, the mic with the earphone, maybe it sounds less muddy and sounds a lot more uh, clear and those still containing those dark elements, which I want. Okay, thank you. So, may I move on to next piece? It's good, gets pressure. May I ask the composer? Yeah, hi, hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, fab. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I won't say too much about this piece because there's a sort of slightly um, uh, esoteric working method behind it. But basically, I was commissioned to write a piece for the Beethoven um, celebrations uh, in 2020, and this this piece kind of grew out of that. Um, I had to select the, the brief was to select a work to sort of base my piece on, and so this is quite a lot of this is drawn from the string quartet um, Opus One Three Two. And what to say really? Well, it is sort of, sort of a, a subjective response to this piece, which I hadn't, which which I I knew a long time ago and loved, and then kind of didn't listen to for a while. So it's a sort of uh, a misremembering of it, and basically it consists of lots of little uh, abstracted pieces of that work, 
in a kind of a, like a mosaic formation. So there's a kind of stasis because I'm taking little pieces of the same part of the work and then kind of layering them on top of each other. Um, yeah, that's probably enough to say, but yeah. Thank you. Thanks for playing it. I'd love to hear it.
Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for playing that. Um, okay, lovely. Thank you. Really good. Um, I, I, I'm going to suggest that maybe what we do is we kind of uh, quickly work backwards through. Um, there's a couple of things uh, I just wanted to ch check with you guys and then a couple of things that you, maybe along the way, if you want to say something, if you can, you can chip in. Um, so just to start with the coda, I had imagined the, um, the Colleno Trato bowing to almost be like one continuous single bow for each note. Um, is is and there's a few kind of repetitions, kind of rebowings and things. Is that uh, in it kind of in service of projection? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Okay. Could we could we try? I mean, could we maybe try? It's going to be incredibly soft, which I which I appreciate, and that's that's fine. I wonder if we could just try a version of the coda, just a couple of repeats, with everybody doing just a single bow. Would that be okay? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I had the short keyboard shortcuts uh, sorted out, but I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it felt it felt much much more intense. I think for being played that way, I thought that was great. Um, and it, but it's interesting that there's an unevenness. So some of the notes are speaking more than others. Um, I don't know. That's something for me to think about a little bit. Um, okay. I mean, I think that sounded that sounded brilliant. Did you? Was there anything you wanted to say about that? Was there anything performer wise? And yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. From the performer's point of view, the collective trato, I mean, we're using the, 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 the wood part to bow on the string, and that, you know, sometimes it, like, some bow may, like, the, um, it, it depends on the actual bow, it that doesn't really sound. And sometimes it sounds, sometimes it, it doesn't, so maybe that's why some notes are more, more present than, than others, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I need to. I need to decide. Um, I need to go away and decide whether that's that's what I want. I mean, I find it quite interesting the way, because obviously you're all dropping out unpredictably as well. So yeah. it's quite interesting the way that sometimes the sounds also speak unpredictably. But that's um, that, that's why we we try to do do like um, more bows in like between each repeat because um, that way it's sort of like we can get more con uh, more con con uh, consistent sound coming out i think inconsistent well i don't know i mean it's interesting it, it felt like there was more activity though as a result of doing that um and I, I quite like the way it was a little unpredictable i don't know that's something for me to think about maybe but I mean, yeah maybe if we have like a, a larger ensemble like we have more players like in orchestra this effect mm. might come out more you know sort of like right more swooshing and, 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 and all, all also that because the rehearsal we make that chord are significantly shorter than what is written, like seven seconds and three seconds, we make it shorter, so maybe that effect doesn't come out. But, but I think it's, it works just fine with, with, with more time and more players. Yeah, yeah, great, great. No, that's fine. I mean, I, yes, it was good. And then I wanted to just so going going back through that, the, through the piece a little bit. So if we go back to sort of bar, um, sorry, bear with me. I'm thinking the start of the section where the the free brackets begin. So yeah, if we go back to bar 59, um, I think I just imagined this an awful lot quieter. So I'm wondering if, if there were sort of questions about the bowing techniques and things. It felt really active and really loud. Um, passages like bar 59. That should be very piano, right? Maybe the way I conduct it, I think. Uh, no, well, I don't know. I mean, I think I think there's uh, there's a few things like for instance the 
the bowing on bridge technique here is designed to produce kind of like a hiss, a very, very quiet sort of white noise effect. I know in a lot of the pieces we've had, we've had bowing kind of behind the bridge or very kind of aggressive extended techniques, but everything here is, is supposed to be exceptionally quiet. It should be like leaves rustling is the effect. Um, I think because there's a variability of what sounds can be produced on the bridge, it might be helpful just to, to have the intended um, sound written somewhere in the parts like air noise or white noise. Yeah, air noise. Okay, that's that's precisely what it should be. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I said this in the chat, but I loved how fragile and delicate everything was. I think um, I like that there are these little disruptions and ruptures and things that come through like the glissandi and scratch and air noises and things. But sometimes I think um, it takes us out of that space a little bit. And I wonder about particularly some of the glissandi, maybe de-emphasizing those like in the low strings in the earlier sections and some of these other scratch tones and noises that, that people have mentioned. Um, so as not to disrupt that kind of beautiful, like glass box kind of thing that you have happening. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I think the, the point here is that at N, it shouldn't be like a kind of scratch thing. What I, what I sort of want is a sort of like almost, because if you take those, those free bars out, what you have is silences, right? So I'm quite interested in the idea uh, in other pieces of kind of like coloring the space a bit. So I don't know, I wonder if we could try a few bars from N maybe up to up to p or something like that and just if everybody can be super 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 quiet whenever they have these free brackets and even things like the, the sort of strummed pitches i was actually thinking it might be nice to try them just with the left hand so when you have these strummed open string figures just kind of really casually really almost play to yourself not to everybody else if you like um, and i wonder if we would have the contrast i'm imagining i mean i, I do take all the points on board there um, I think that's fair enough. But, um. All right, we will try that later N until P. Yeah, it's interesting. It's still, I don't know, it's really hard to tell without sitting in the room with you whether the projection is coming across because Zoom is doing something to the audio or whether it, <laughs> whether it's actually, it's actually just projecting because like Jason says, it's busy and it's kind of, um, I don't know, interpolating itself into the, in, into the sound in, a, in an uncomfortable way. It's interesting. I'm going to have to think about that quite hard, I think. Um, I think what they play, like how they played it, just now does fit into the character of the overall piece much better. Um, I wonder if sometimes there are like one to two too many events yeah. in each bracket because um, you sort of have each part doing all the different techniques like bridge, yeah. left, like strum, gliss. Um, most of them have like all of them. So maybe it's about just, you know, distributing them in a yeah. way where um, each person does color the silence just with one sound. Um, I think that would maybe get rid of the slightly frantic feel. Yeah, that that's too much activity. Have. Yeah. Could we, could we try that maybe just, just maybe the two bars at N and have everybody play, um, maybe like every third gesture or something like that. What, what do you mean by so every every one in three 
So rather than playing every single thing inside the box, play play one and then ignore two and then play the fourth one, if you like. Feels a lot closer, yeah. I mean, I, I think maybe the solution is also just to make those gaps, just to have longer time, so just have have much more space in between the calls. Um, but that's that's for me to sort out, not you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, I suppose one thing, and I, I suppose this is something to just kind of throw open, and if people have have thoughts on it and, and on other things, then I'd, I'd really welcome them. But just just. Um, just occasionally not hearing layers. Do you know what I mean? So, so sometimes it feels to me like there ought to be more space between the gestures. And, I, and I'm wondering actually if some of the places where I have long notes which tie into the following beat, whether some of those actually could just be taken out. Um, I'm not suggesting we do that now, but I, I definitely am struggling to hear the layers a little bit in what I've written, I think, and maybe... It might also be to do with those background parts. Like I did wonder about the... Um, you know, for each of the three sections, there's one player who plays independently, whether if they were muted or something that might solve that problem. Um, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure. Sometimes it feels like we don't hear, I think what I'm trying to say is sometimes it feels like we don't hear the the gaps, the spaces between gestures. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. <laughs> I'm sure it's something to do that I need to change. But um, um, Are you talking about hearing the counterpoint between the the layered parts? Yeah, sometimes that's the problem. Yeah. And, I, and and also we have that that third layer in every section, which is repeating. And I'm wondering if that's getting in the way a little bit too. Um, I'm not sure. I, that's a good question. I, I did have one thought and um, it has to do with rhythm and meter. Um, mm -hmm. And it might tie into the issue that you're, you're sensing. Um, as I look through the music, I see, you know, the music is notated in... Uh, with like a quarter note pulse uh, throughout and it's you know four four going to three four and things like that but we have a, a pretty steady quarter note pulse um, but as I look at the music most of it has this running eighth note triplet on almost every beat um, in that meter and it makes me wonder if you might get a more clear counterpoint a more precise playing if this was notated in like 12 8 or 9 8 as as you see fit but using a, a compound meter instead so that you didn't have to write so many eighth note triplets but could occasionally use you know a duple eighth note uh, when the time is right uh, that might be something to think about uh, there, you can't really do that uh, on the spot or anything like that, but it might be something to consider to get really clear uh, counterpoint results in the playing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a good. That is a good suggestion. That's quite a feature, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think performance-wise, it would clear out the the textures would be cleared out if we. You know, the third layer, you mean the third violin, second violin, right? The uh, ostinato. If everything but that, um, so whenever you have a swell, if we could focus more on the soft side of things, if it was overall softer with a, a few um, swells here and there, so it's more of this um, radiant texture, you know, uh, and then this ostinato just stays kind of, in its own space. And I think if that was the case, the Astinana could also remain softer and be more gentle and kind of flowing. I think that's one. But I think Are you talking about in the, sorry, Karen. 
No, I, I'm talking about generally the, the the beginning of the piece, for example. Yeah, um, and I think is that is that a notational thing or is that a, a performance thing? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think you have to exaggerate notation a little bit, maybe. Um, but we could, it could also be something that's just in more rehearsal time. You know, it's a very delicate, nuanced piece. Um, but I think similar to what we did with the uh, section with the extended technique stuff, I think it feels a little bit dense, so you can't to just hear everything. You know, um, could be the case too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a thought. Um. um yeah. I was interested. Sorry, yeah. Please carry. If someone's got some some more comments, please. I I was just gonna say also. I mean, I I said this in the chat, but with a larger orchestra, you know, all these issues will be multiplied because the texture is only going to be more dense. So you know, the solution could be just simply adding a note that at any point the musicians are free to omit material um, in order to make the texture more sparse. And just giving them a little bit more flexibility with that. I mean, just just even you know, uh, nota bene sort of thing that would then allow them to feel free to do that. That's one thing I like to try, is that we we will play again from very beginning and be careful not to over sustain the note. When you have the rest, please make it make it stop. Okay really stop and then we kind of exaggerated the dynamic a little bit when you have like mezzo piano or diminuendo or crescendo or whatever we, we exaggerate, exaggerate that okay and we care, be careful of the rest when when we stop playing not to over sustain the notes and let let let's hear is it work better okay that would be great could i just make make a, a, a tiny request as well if we if we're going from the top could we try with um, violin 2C muted, would that be okay? Just to see if that does make any difference. That would be, that'd be great, thank you. I think it is a lot better. Yeah. And I, and I think um, we're having a side conversation in the chat about it, but I think I can do a bit of work in the writing to actually clean that up too. So just more rests for, for starters would be, would probably or, or slightly, slightly increased length of rests would be, would be helpful too. That feels a lot better. And, and I think it, it makes that second violin kind of like a very, very, very pale color. So there is, although the color palette is really uh, restricted, there is a little bit of depth to it that's kind of interesting at the lower end of that too now, which I think we, did, we didn't have before. So, um, All right. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Much, everyone. Uh, we are about the time to finish our workshop today. Hopefully everyone enjoy and have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. So, see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. So, hope you have, hope you have. Congratulations to everybody. Really fantastic work. Mm -hmm.